My name is Heather Feather. I am the owner of Rare Bird Medicine, and today's topic is be a fool. Oh, good. <laughs> good one. I've always wanted to be a fool. <laughs> this is what I mean, one of the topics I'll be talking about in the shamanic class that I've created that starts on Monday um, is the sacred clown path, the Hayoka empath. Big, big ups and shout out to Evan is transdimensional on Instagram for bringing the Hayoka empath wisdom into my life. What I can say is the concept of a sacred clown in native tradition, you know, you, know, you could also call this trickster spirit because coyote, raven, crow, uh, for the Lakota, Iktomi is a spider trickster. There are several power animals that are considered tricksters. And what's tricky about them, <laughs> how are you such a tricky little beast is that they foundationally what they do is they shake the ego. They cause the ego to um, be shaked from its complacency of thinking it's so cool. <laughs> and that's tricky because it's medicinal and it's helpful, but it's also uncomfortable to have our egos shaken. I hold a lot of Raven, Crow, Coyote, Iktomi, uh, I would call it magic and medicine. It depends on the native tradition. Some people would see coyote as beneficent. Some people would see coyote as, you know, messing with God's stars and causing the Milky Way and causing problems. It depends on, on the tradition and culture that you study as far as these power animals are concerned. But I've always seen them as really um, beneficial power animals. Certainly raven, crow, grackle, all the blackbirds, whenever I'm doing healing psychic surgery and psychic healing or kundalini healings for people those are the birds that i use to take things to the void so i do a lot of simpatico relationship and praying for their nest and their bellies and all of this and then they come and take things away back to the void that i am, am ready to release from self or others as i work um, i find them to be quite helpful i do find it to be quite challenging to hold this medicine because it's real tricky um, so spirit invoked in me, I have several, I have a ton, I mean, a long list of sacred clown, why I'm a fool stories. Um, there's a bunch, but let's just deal with this week's foolishness, shall we? So I want to talk about how, how this foolishness can show up in one's life. I was blessed with the opportunity to go see the hip hop artist Atmosphere as well as Cypress Hill. Um, this past weekend, I deeply love Atmosphere. I have a ton of Atmosphere merch. Uh, I really appreciate his lyrics and relate to a lot of what he says. So worth checking out if, if you don't know his tunes. What I can say is that um, at the at the before heading to that show, I love to dance. I love hip hop. I love to dance to hip hop. And the visual my ego had of what was going to happen because I was going with somebody that I find very attractive was that I was going to dance, it was going to be attractive, it was going to be so fun, it was, this is going to be so cute, you know. Um, and what happened is I blacked out. I blacked out um, on a set of stairs, <laughs> just kind of crumpled like a sack of potatoes on top of my head. Um, I'm pretty sure I got a concussion, not a severe one, but, you know, spent days smelling acetone and um, not hungry, but forcing myself to eat over and over again. And headachy and blah 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 uh what what didn't happen is i didn't get to dance around and look cool <laughs> i got to look like a fool i got to look like a friggin fool here you go do you find this attractive i'm just gonna black out and draw attention to us in a social situation you're welcome but if you truly are understanding the medicine of this foolishness then this is a story you can tell that can aid others to heal because what is the point of looking cool? What am I doing? Trying to impress people I don't know? I don't care. It's like, I don't care if I impress your ego. Oh, did I impress your ego? Oh, how valuable and precious am I? Like, ooh, did I look good for you? Uh, gross. <laughs> gross. <laughs> um, and I have an ego. Certainly, you know, there's plenty of times in life where I want to look good or I want to fit in or um, I, after I had the concussion, found a hundo. I had this hundred dollar bill. I thought it was a 10 because I was a little hallucinating weird. But so I had this hundo that blows towards me. And I'm like, thanks universe. I'll get a hat to cover up this bump on my head. And 
later I post a picture because I was like, that's so fun that I found hundred bucks. It, it was a, a direct correlation with a manifestation. I had been visualizing money blowing towards me because I thought that's fun. It used to be a conflict of consciousness. If I found money on the ground, I was like, how do I return it to the owner? And I've had to learn that like, if no one's around, it's yours. <laughs> so it was cool. I was like, oh, I'm 45. Now I know this is mine. And then I post a picture and my dear friend Jesse is like, hey, Heather, that is a motion picture. <laughs> it's like a fake. It's very well done. Like, hello, sketch. You maybe are creating counterfeits in your spare time. But it basically says on it, for motion picture use only. And so that was hilarious <laughs> because I share this story with everyone. And then immediately I can always expect some kind of tomfoolery, some type of clownery that if I say something, I'm constantly evoked. If I see something, if I want something, I'm constantly evoked to experience the flipping of that coin and to engage with it, with it in a different way than I initially maybe anticipated. And I can say throughout my life, it's been really challenging. I'm a very truth focused soul. I love the truth. I want the truth. I seek the truth. And it is um, tricky to constantly have things turn upside down, you know, but this is still perfect. The Akashic Records has just told me a bunch that I have movies to produce and books to produce and classes to produce and, you know, value in the motion picture use of what I have to offer in this realm. So they were like, you know, this is a, this is a sign, symbol, and clue from the universal language of mind and consciousness. Was I upset that it wasn't a hundred? No, I don't care. It's all energy. <laughs> that is a fun, energetic message. I had an experience when I lived in California, I was having dreams about someone all the time, someone that I worked with, and I would dream that they were my soulmate. And um, I deeply rely on my psychic side. I rely on my intuition. I trust my intuition. And it's interesting because this person is someone cool that I liked, but something about them kind of reminded me of an ex when I first started there. Even though I found him attractive, I was like, mm, probably, you know, because you remind me of an ex, it's, we're probably just meant to be friends. And that's how I received them. But then when I started having these dreams, and I had them for four to five years, I was like, I think you're my soulmate because <laughs> like, I believe my intuition and, and the dreams were very visceral and very real. I felt like I was with my beloved, with my soulmate, um, you know? And so of course I go to them and I'm like, I, I feel drawn to you. And they're like, no, I mean, they're very professional. I'm like, no, ew, <laughs> not really, ew, but kind of like no. So that was embarrassing. <laughs> that made me feel like a fool. And because I continued to have the dreams, I continued to feel, feel compelled to be with this person. I continue to like, no, I really feel like my subconscious mind is still, I don't understand why you're not on program because it feels like you're probably my soulmate. <laughs> That's what I keep dreaming about. But I get myself into circumstances, engaging with this person, engaging with their family. Like <laughs> I was out socializing and thought I had money on me and didn't and wound up having to borrow money from his family member, uh, which is embarrassing. Like socially, you don't, you don't want to be the person that's like, I'm ill prepared as a grown adult to handle tonight's circumstances, <laughs> but also want to have fun. I'm not going to stand here without a drink in my hand while we're all socializing. So I handled it, paid him back with bonus, but life has given me lots of experiences where I'm, I feel like a clown. It's like, Oh, we're just, Oh, we're just clowning down here. Okay. Just never going to do look cool. You know, <laughs> Even in high school, I was listening to Susie and the Banshees. I was in my ego. I was like, yes, yeah, Susie and the Banshees. It was raining. I turned. It was just like rocking out. It was like feeling the vibe. And boom, right into a brick wall. <laughs> yeah, not as cool as you think. Calm down. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> so the reason I want to talk about being a fool, the reason I want to talk about adopting sacred clown mentality is because the ego is not the enemy. Everyone has an ego. I don't, I, I think it's precious and valuable to not elicit that aspects of your innate matrix and in being are necessary, villainous, bad, or wrong, or, or need to be fought against. Um, you know, I would say Newtonian mechanistic thinking could be the enemy if we wanted to go that route, but it's not, you know, it, it everything serves a function. Some aspects of Newtonian mechanistic thinking serve a function to operate in this realm in the same way that like having an ego serves for you to function in this realm. The ego labels things. 
The challenge is, is that the, the label maker called the ego, instead of discerning what things are, yes, more of that, no, none of that, thank you, it is judging. That's good, you're bad, you know. It's gone into judgment instead of discernment, um, which can make it a little challenging. So I love Coyote Raven Crow medicine, and I love this trickster component of challenging your ego. One of the ways I've done that is through a text called A Course in Miracles that I've spoken about before. It's an ego deconstruction system. And starting January 1st, I always, it's 365 lessons, so my OCD is not trying to start that in the middle of the year. <laughs> but starting January 1st, I'm going to pick it up again. Uh, and I tend to do that and, and often teach that because I think it supports to step into allowing yourself to look like a fool, to not look cool. What is the, like, what is cool? First of all, I can tell you there are lots of things that I could say, this is cool, you guys, this is cool. Nightmares on wax, you know, th that nature video that I'm always posting everywhere. <laughs> that is cool. You know, shamanic teachers, that is cool. Um, being medicinal, that is cool. You know, and there are people that will be like, no, nah, being cool is like being rough and tumble and, you know, having a lot of sauce or whatever. Like p different people think different things are cool, you know, and uh, it's just a judgment. So is that cool? I don't know. I don't think judgment's that cool. <laughs> is anything cool? Maybe not. You know, like maybe it just is. Maybe it just is and we don't have to judge everything. I feel like there's a lot about being a two-legged that is about avoiding looking bad, avoiding being human. I mean, I know for sure my focus on spirituality my entire life, often the many therapists that I've seen throughout my life are like, okay, let's take a minute to accept that we're human. <laughs> I'm like, that sounds foreign. <laughs> like what? I'm human. Pretty sure I'm galactic light. I don't, <laughs> you know, like I don't even relate to the body. In a lot of ways, I relate to spirit. So, so allowing myself to have a human experience, to be human, to be fallible, to get it wrong, to make mistakes, to strive towards excellence, but still often not attain perfection or even attain the excellence that I'm working towards. To understand that whatever unfolds ultimately serves. If I am somebody that wanted to understand unconditional love and I'm somebody as an entity that wanted to understand unconditional compassion, then what greater opportunity than to constantly be given the chance to laugh at myself and have compassion with my own foolishness and therefore compassion with others. You know, if they look foolish, when I blacked out, there was a lady next to me that was barfing, you know, like clearly this is where we're going to come have challenges at the show, <laughs> but I've been there. You know what I mean? So is she a fool? Is she a jerk? Is she an embarrassment? Because she, like, have you ever barfed somewhere? Have you ever done something that's like, oh, you know, like humans, like when, when I trip, I'm like, oh, freaking, that part is sticking up, which is why I tripped, you know, <laughs> just immediately. But it's like, I tripped because I'm human and I didn't come here to be cool. I didn't come here to appease everybody's ego. I often say, I'm not here to appease anyone's ego, not mine, not yours, not anyone's. Because what is that? Like, if I appease you, if you're like, oh my God, chin style call. So? <laughs> what have we achieved here? You know what I mean? What, what, have, what have we achieved if we have just appeased one of the smaller aspects of ourselves? Can we laugh? Can we laugh like a clown? at this foolishness down here. Can we just laugh like, like <laughs> that was some Tom Fuller. I gotta tell you, most of my life is about laughing at myself. And I often see humans still, I don't know, sometimes grab a paper like they're doing a, a clown-like cartwheel and I'm like, yes, you are mirroring to me that I'm a fool. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. Like life shows me all the time that I'm a fool. And the more I embrace that, the greater freedom I have to express anything in the moment of now without shame, recrimination, judgment, fear, concern, anxiety, worry, which are definitely things I've done historically. I hope you'll join us on Monday to talk some more about this sacred clown foolishness for a class on shamanism starting at 6 p.m. Mountain Monday. Go to rarebirdmedicine.com, click on the classes link. Blessed be.